Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Alex Engler. I'm a fellow here at Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. I want to welcome you all to our event on the democratic future of the internet. And this is hosted by the Center for Technology Innovation. Um, I'm just going to frame the problem briefly before inviting up our guests. Um, the global recession of democracy is unquestionably one of the defining issues of the 21st century. In 1995, the third wave of democratization had just finished, and over half of the world's countries were democracies. Um, fast forward to 2006, about when most agree that we began a global recession of democracy. The Varieties of Democracy Index um, says that between 2011 and 2021, the population under autocracy, living under autocracy, uh, increased from 49 to 71%. It's a dramatic increase, and it's not just them. If you look at indices from Freedom House or the Economist Intelligence Unit or International IDEA, all of them suggest a recession of democracy that is accelerating and getting worse faster. Um, the Internet is only one part of this, but it's a genuinely important component. Um, autocracies have proven more willing and more capable to curb Internet freedoms um, through censorship and Internet shutdowns, as well as to use digital technologies for political influence, surveillance, and control. Um, we're going to hear from Ali Funk later, research director at the Freedom of the Net, um, uh, whose report says that global Internet freedom has declined for the 11th consecutive year. Stephen Feldstein, whose book, The Rise of Digital Repression, uh, expects an unremitting struggle between authoritarians and civic activists over digital spaces. Um, and Jessica Brandt, our, from our Brookings, who will join us later, uh, argues that Russia and China's online disinformation efforts have the goal of denting the global prestige of democracy. At best, the rise of the internet was contemporaneous with this fall of global democracy, and at worst, it's been contributing to it. And that's what some of the broader research that we're finding today shows. This is the backdrop for a new global initiative spearheaded by the Biden administration with partners around the world called the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. Um, signed by more than 50 countries, the Declaration sets forth a code of practice for governance and the use of technology with respect to democratic norms. Its broad vision, aspiring to promote universal internet access, protect human rights, ensure fair economic uh, competition, uh, design secure digital infrastructure, and promote pluralism as well as freedom of expression, um, is important. It's intended to be a reset and refocus on how governments should treat a free, open, and pro-democratic internet uh, at a time when it is surely needed. Uh, to hear more about this declaration, in just a second, um, we're honored to be joined by Tim Wu and Peter Harrell, two of the lead White House architects of the declaration. Um, Peter Harrell is Senior Director for International Economics and Competitiveness at the White House National Security Council, and formerly under the Obama administration, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for uh, Counter Threat Finance and Sanctions. Um, Tim Wu is Special Assistant to the President for Technology and Competition Policy. Uh, he is uh, formerly a professor at Columbia University Law School, where he's known for his contributions on antitrust and big tech, as well as, quite famously, net neutrality. In just a second, I'll invite Tim Wu onto the stage to introduce uh, the declaration, um, and then we'll have a conversation between Tim, uh, Peter, and myself before that follow-up of our other panelists that I mentioned. A quick uh, few logistics. This is being recorded and live streamed. Um, so we welcome uh, further audience uh, participation. You can send questions to events at brookings.edu or via Twitter at brookingsgov. Or if you're in the room, there is a card that you're sitting on well labeled to, to um, submit questions later on. Uh, and lastly, through the hashtag uh, Future of Internet, also on Twitter. Uh, with that, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Tim Wu onto the stage for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you so much, Alex, for that uh, introduction. And, uh, you know, this event actually just came out of a kind of a conversation with Alex and I, and I appreciate that we've been able to, to put this, uh, to do this. I, I'm very happy to be here in, in person. Uh, I think Brookings on the inside said this is the, maybe one of the very first or maybe the first uh, invent, uh, in-person event they've done in a while, so let's hope we all remember how to do this. <laughs> um, so I want to, uh, uh, again, thank Brookings and uh, and. Uh, offer a few remarks on the Declaration of the Future of the Internet and what we uh, are aspiring uh, to do with it. So on April 28th of this year, the United States, along with uh, 60, more than 60 partners, 
uh, launch the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. And it is, in its core, quite, quite simple. The idea is to announce clearly to the world our shared democratic vision for principles for conduct on the Internet and for the use of digital technologies. We think this comes at an extraordinarily important time. The President has often said that we are in the midst of an epic and, in fact, a, a historic struggle between authoritarianism and democracy. And we see the Internet and the question of what the Internet will be, will become, and its future to be key uh, to winning that struggle. The Internet, uh, while invented in America, has become a global phenomenon. It has unlocked the potential of people around the world and has advanced human progress in many areas of life. Uh, all of us, uh, during the, or most of us during the pandemic, um, uh, saw the Internet as a lifeline, how we got critical information, continued to work, communicate with families and friends, educate our children. That's the happy story. But the fact is, in recent years, very basic Internet freedoms have not been respected in a way we had all hoped back in the earlier days, 1990s, early thousands. Some governments have come to see the Internet as nothing more than another tool of state power. They use it to repress freedom of expression, to spread disinformation, and to deny their citizens basic human rights. Some countries have shut down the Internet when it suits them, have censored legitimate news sources, spied on dissidents, prevented human rights advocates from reporting on abuses. We have also witnessed state-sponsored cybercrime harming people and businesses. We live in an era where government-sponsored disinformation campaigns have become a tool of state aggression. We in other countries have been targeted for, by those who sow scenes of division by deliberately spreading harmful disinformation online in an effort to undermine democracy. We live in a world where bots spread disinformation about the war in Ukraine, about COVID, and we live in a world where children, minors, and others face sexual, har sexual harassment and other harms online. To sum it up, we live in a world where online freedom is on the retreat. We have countries plotting cyber attacks that cripple real world infrastructure, spying on dissidents, journalists, and others. That is why we think it is crucial, and in fact, a strategically essential moment for us working together with partner nations to make the internet better, to make it safer, and to make it the foundation of democracy that it should be. It is key in our view that democracies rise to this moment because we need to understand this battle for internet freedoms as, part, as a key part of this larger battle for freedom and democracy more generally. I think anyone who doesn't see in the future of the internet, the future of civilization, the future of government, has not seen where the future lies. We cannot neglect the importance of internet freedoms as we confront the rise of authoritarian governments around the world. And these are the reasons it is time to declare fundamental principles. We are affirming, and we did affirm in the declaration, our commitment to an internet that is open and free, an internet that is global and interoperable, an internet that is reliable and secure. It's important to remember that the first wave of the Internet's history was full of promise and possibility. The dream was of a network that would bring the world together, a sort of common language, an Esperanto of network protocols. The second wave held the promise of commerce, but has in many ways become marked by too much inequality, too much use of the network to divide instead of unite. We see the launch and we see this period as part of the beginning and reflecting a third wave of the Internet revolution. This administration and our partner nations want to champion a return to the Internet that promotes the best of culture, commerce, 
that connects humanity while remaining respectful of human rights, seeking not to undermine them, and promoting a fairer deal economically for everyone around the world. That is why the Declaration states and endorses a set of key principles that promote our collective vision. They include principles to promote human rights and fundamental freedoms, including online safety for children and young people, promotion of a global internet that advances the free flow of information and advances affordable access to the internet so that all people can benefit from the digital economy. On that last point, I want to add that the Biden administration uh, domestically has done our own part with $65 billion for broadband infrastructure build-outs that are currently uh, beginning to go underway. Another thing we want to do is promote trust in the digital ecosystem through the protection of privacy. The President stated in the State of the Union address that we need to strengthen privacy in this country, strengthen privacy protections, and that is reflected in the DFI as well. We want to protect, I should also emphasize, a multi-stakeholder internet governance system that keeps the internet running for the benefit of all. Moving forward, we intend to uphold these principles and encourage citizens, businesses, and civil society organizations to do the same. We are united by a belief in the potential of digital technologies to promote connectivity, democracy, peace, and the rule of law. That is why I think we all need to understand that the fight for freedom on the Internet is the fight for freedom, period. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Tim. Thanks for your comments. Thank you, Peter, for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to start with some questions, first about the declaration, before zooming out to some of the broader context and challenges and the agenda of the Biden administration. Can you speak a little bit to the criteria and the process for inclusion and invit invitation for other countries to sign the declaration? And under what for future circumstances can you imagine other countries uh, joining? No. Um Thanks a lot, and I want to thank you, Alex, and Brookings for hosting uh, this event. Thanks and, for coming. Um, really a pleasure for us to be here in person to talk about uh, this initiative, which we obviously launched a couple of months ago, but which we are thrilled to be able to carry forward, because this is very much something that, as your question suggests, we uh, are, taking, uh, are taking forward. And on your question about... Um, criteria for future membership, I should say, actually, since launch, we've had a country come in. South Korea uh, joined last mm -hmm. month um, uh, while the president uh, was out in Asia. South Korea had kind of been between governments um, uh, at the launch of the, the DFI, but I think the fact that South Korea um, is now in shows our commitment to carrying this, uh, carrying this forward and building out, um, building out membership. Look, I think we wanted, as Tim's very eloquent opening remarks suggested, we wanted to have a membership and want to have a membership that is both inclusive but also encourages uh, a driving higher of standards. You know, we wanted something, and I think you saw this with the focus, the way in which we got a number of, you know, key emerging market countries like Argentina to come in. We wanted something that was not going to be seen as just a sort of club of the G7 or the G7+, plus, but a platform that we could use to build out this set of really critical values and commitments to a broader uh, collection of countries from both the global north and the global south. And I think you saw that with the countries that were represented um, at, uh, at launch. Now, obviously, as we were thinking about that inclusive membership, we want members that are prepared to work with us to carry forward the agenda Tim just laid out. So we want countries and have had countries that are prepared to make commitments to respect you know, basic freedoms uh, online, that are prepared to make commitments and have a history of not shutting off you know, major network access um, uh, nodes, not shutting off uh, major uh, platforms, that are prepared to work with us on issues like competition policy and ways in which we can have an economically inclusive uh, internet. So it was really about how do we find countries that 
you know, are interested both on what they have done and what they've shown they, they, they have done, as well as in kind of their conceptual framework of working with us across all the different areas that Tim laid out and that are reflected in the DFI. If I could just add one thing to that. Uh, when we say we, I just want to emphasize this has been not just the United States, but there's been, uh, you know, the European uh, Union has been a, a, a one of the foundational partners along with uh, Japan, Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, and others. And, you know, it has been a joint diplomatic effort. And I think that there is a shared interest uh, in the main democracies in the world that we have a very broad uh, kind of thing, that it not just be, as, as, as Peter said, sort of a G7 uh, kind of initiative. So I just want to, uh, you know, emphasize that this has uh, been a very much from the beginning a joint project. Sure. So you just emphasized the idea of an inclusive project, also trying to drive higher standards. Um, of course, you're going to get many countries that are engaged and want to do that, uh, but no country has a perfect track record on these issues. Um, the declaration is non-binding. How do you examine or how do you expect next steps to come forward um, when countries who are signatories take actions that might break the spirit or the exact writing of the, of the declaration? So I think that's a challenging question for, I think, any um, international regime. The reason that the partners are coming together is we want to reverse the current trajectory in the rise of digital authoritarianism and reaffirm the vision of an open, free, uh, and uh, global secure Internet. And I think that is, is sort of key to the shared mission. We want to get people aligned on the sense that this is the direction uh, things could, should be going as opposed to saying, you know, here is sort of like a, a code which, you know, tiny uh, variations will be uh, punished. So I, I think that um, one of, the, one of the, the, the keys to making this uh, move forward, even, as you, as you said, it's non-binding, I think one of the keys to move forward is, is just to, to, to keep the momentum going, uh, add more countries to it, um, uh, keep the conferences, and, and make it, I mean, one of the, the things that I think is so important about these kind of documents is they make it clear to the world what the standards are. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you name any law uh, that's out there, um, it will be uh, any law or any uh, set of principles, and they will be uh, you know, violated by one point or another. Uh, but the question is whether it has this sort of norm-setting function, where there's a reference point as to what you should and should uh, not be doing. I don't know if you want to add to that, Peter. The thing I would add in terms of... Um uh, sort of uh, immediate, or not immediate, but sort of second half of this year, next steps. As Tim said, we are we are looking both to build out additional membership, and then we are also looking at building kind of practical cooperation among uh, among members. In terms of building practical cooperation among members, we are talking with our kind of core group uh, that pulled this together about um, potentially having a kind of conference in the second half of the year where we would work together to really build out work streams, and also where, frankly, to your question, Alex, on um, what happens for countries that uh, you know, breach the standards here, we would hope to have some civil society feedback and other stakeholder feedback to really help hold uh, to account those members that aren't living up uh, to the standards while making some practical recommendations uh, to the governments about how they can better uh, live up to the standards. Uh, so on that topic, the Secretary of State, Etsy Blinken, announced a few weeks ago that the United States will become chair of the Freedom Online Coalition next year. Um, the, there are also other groups like the Internet Governance Forum, the UN International Telecoms Union. Uh, do you see the declaration within this broader context of multi-stakeholder groups and have a plan to engage? Absolutely. And first, uh, let me say we are we are thrilled um, as uh, the Biden Harris administration to be the chair of the Freedom Online uh, Coalition uh, next year. Really appreciate the work that Canadians uh, have been doing this year uh, as the chair uh, of the FOC, and look forward to carrying that forward. Look, the DFI, uh, in addition to sort of thinking through DFI specific next steps um, later this year, we do see as a platform which we can then 
feed into and leverage in other fora, right? So this is something we can use as the basis for joint statements, for example, at the G7. It's broader than the G7, but we can use as the basis for joint statements at the G7. We can use as the basis for joint statements and joint work in UN bodies. And it is certainly something, if you look at the values uh, in the DFI, that we look forward to working with the FOC to help carry forward uh, large parts of this work. So I think you've expressed a kind of theory of change of the declaration behind the signatories and behind maybe weaker or democracies and hybrid regimes that might aspire to join. I think that you've made a case there. Um, But there are also more adversarial autocracies, especially including Russia and China, among others, um, that are not only accused of being digitally repressive, but of exporting a model of digital authoritarianism. Um, to what extent do you yourselves and the administration see that as a core issue here, or do you consider see that as a what? Sorry, a core issue. Apologies. Oh, right. Or do you see this more as uh, localized to developments of the use of re- digital repression within other countries? So, look, I, I think um, from our perspective, it seems pretty clear that repressive governments around the world are learning from one another, one another, are comparing practices. Uh, and are working in some way to sort of strengthen their alternative model of what the uh, the internet um, what the internet should look like. I mean, you spoke, um, uh, you know, in your opening uh, remarks about the way in which we are in a recession for democracy globally, and I think that is very much true online. And I do think we, as a coalition of broadly like-minded states, need to be. Uh, rather aggressively pushing back against a model of digital authoritarianism that we're seeing coming out of China, that we're seeing coming out of Russia. Certainly the stakes couldn't be higher when you look at what's going on between Russia and Ukraine uh, today. And we see kind of the DFI and getting a broad coalition of countries aligned behind the principles in the DFI across all these different areas of values, areas of work, as an important part of pushing back on that model of digital authoritarianism that we do think is um, unfortunately uh, being spread, uh, you know, across um, uh, a dispiriting number of countries. Yeah, I want to add to that. I think that that's exactly right. And let us add, you know, sort of historic note, which is, you know, I think democracies have uh, been at their most successful when they recognize the, the challenge that they're facing uh, from a spreading movement and re- responding to it. And, you know, we've done it before, um, and we can do it again, um, but it, it requires us to realize what, what's going on. And I think that's part of, you know, what, what's happening. And I, I, I don't want to um, say others haven't. You know, I, there's, as, as you, you already said, there's, there's measurements of Internet freedom and so forth and going on. But sort of moving it to the front of consciousness um, and recognizing you know, issues of internet freedom as, you know, not uh, so much uh, necessarily a sideshow, but really front and central to the, to the to, in some ways, the future of civilization and, um, you know, how we will, will live in the future is part of what we're trying, uh, trying to do here. And I think it's um, important that we very, be very strategic in, in our thinking about the challenges in this space, and that's what we're, we're doing here. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to echo this point a little bit. Even just reading to prepare for this event, it's hard. The, the gravity of the challenge really does uh, strike you up there with any other, other problem that democracies broadly are facing. Um, because of this, I am assuming that there is a broader set of initiatives coming from the Biden administration on pro-democratic uh, Internet uh, technologies. You mentioned broadband. You mentioned a commitment to privacy, which we just recently saw a Senate agreement, potentially some path forward on uh, privacy legislation. Are there other um, big... I see a Senate agreement. I'd like to see that. Uh, <laughs> reporting of a Senate agreement, maybe? All right. <laughs> no, I was, uh, sort of was... Inside, it's sort of an inside joke, but all right. <laughs> maybe uh, not, a, not a good one. Right. Uh, not, not what I'm inside of. But, yeah. um, so are there a bunch of other uh, initiatives and proposals that you're you're looking to from the Biden administration or, or from you, Congress? You want us to tell you about the secret proposals that we haven't told anyone. About <laughs> well, so I don't know. Maybe Peter, if you want. No, I, 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 I actually I, see I, others I, that are related. I could name yeah. them, but I'm wondering if you if you sort of what your perception is of what the Biden administration is doing. How much of its efforts are for democratic preservation around the world, yeah. around the internet freedom specifically? 
you want to talk some domestically, Tim? And then yeah, I'll well, maybe I'll talk about the, uh, the, the domestic uh, front as well. I'm, first of all, curious to see your list and mm. see how it compares to our list because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm interested to see. Uh, you know, one thing I'll notice about working in the, the White House is there's a gap between what you think you're saying and what people are hearing, which um, I don't know why that is, but you know what I mean? It's just like kind of like we, what uh, – and I'm, I'm always fascinated and interested to hear how we're – uh, what we're doing is being is being heard, but I, I want to say that you know on the, on the domestic side, you know this administration uh, from the beginning has thought that in order to uh, preserve a democracy at home, that we also have to be um, serious about some of the challenges we're facing on the domestic uh, tech front. Um, one of the things, as I said, the president spoke in the State of the Union about the need for strong privacy privacies gen- generally. Also spoke on the need for strong uh, protection of, of children and young people. And, you know, just to stick on, on privacy for a second and, and talk about why that's uh, so important, one of the great challenges we see in our era is the uh, collection of intimate information from, from everyone so that you get served up with information which is uh, tailored exactly to who you are, which often means that which you find the most enraging, alarming, controversial, or so forth. And, you know, one of the things we think is that these, uh, the, the current uh, situation online has led to uh, uh, domestically uh, a, a fractioning, a partitioning of our, our democracy, a sort of uh, a loss of, of, of the center. And it's something the president is, is himself has often spoken of, of being a great concern. One of the reasons he ran, uh, began the run for office was, was seeing what was happening in Charlottesville. So I think that um, much of what um, we are interested in doing uh, for the international struggle uh, begins with the domestic side and, and the need to, to make sure we have a handle on what's going on with democracy at home. i just comment uh, briefly on some of the international side of the agenda. I mean, we see the DFI as you know, a signature piece of work and a signature initiative uh, for the administration and one that we want to carry into another of other uh, fora, but it's not our only um, uh, internet, um, uh, international internet sort of freedom uh, agenda. As you alluded to, as you mentioned at the beginning, we're going to be chairing uh, the Freedom Online Coalition uh, next year. We've been working through the U.S. EU Trade and Technology Council on joint approaches to things like Russian uh, disinformation um, across the, the world coming out of the war on uh, war on uh, on Ukraine. We obviously are pushing very hard for uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin to take over um, as head of the ITU uh, in the current election. So we're really, you know, we have a, a stream of work that's about kind of elevating our profile and our role in multilateral, relevant multilateral organizations. And then we're looking at ways we can use different existing fora to carry forward different aspects of the values that are reflected in the DFI as appropriate in those different uh, fora. And then, of course, you know, we launched the, the DFI a little bit um, parallel to the President's Democracy Summit in December. We obviously launched it several months uh, later, which gave us a chance to have kind of more of a freestanding uh, launch for this and also reflected the way in which that, the, the, the DFI really is, as Tim said in his opening remarks, something that we have done in partnership uh, with a couple of core allies, more than just this being an American um, uh, initiative. But from a Biden administration perspective, obviously we are now sort of halfway through the year of action uh, coming out of the President's Democracy Summit uh, last uh, December, going into the follow-up uh, this December. And as you know, there are a number of different work streams there uh, focused on, um, on Internet freedom. I think we should... Um you know, mention now, if not uh, later, another one of the initiatives that's out there is the State Department is launching their new, mm-hmm. maybe this was on your list, Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy. And that, you know, we haven't, I think, appointed or announced person, but we'll soon have a senior envoy, uh, and there's a, a, you know, a spot for internet, free, internet freedom. So I, I think, you know, I don't want to suggest this all the White House. There's a, a significant stuff out of both State Department, uh, USAID is, uh, you know, the has a number of initiatives that uh, uh, that uh, Sam Power was talking has been uh, talking about lately. So there, it is. Uh, I want to emphasize not just the White House, but I think an, an administration-wide effort to tackle the serious questions surrounding internet freedom and democracy. Sure. Speaking of the uh, State Department, Anthony Blinken very recently um, 
said that we need to get anti-censorship tech into the hands that need it, which I think is a, in the spirit of what we've been talking about today. Um, recently, there's also been some reporting suggesting that the Open Technology Fund, which funds and supports the building of anti-censorship and free internet access tools, has received more funding from the United States. Do you see those developments as related as part of the sort of broader strategy? Yes, I think the, the administration, um, you know, across the administration, uh, sees these as, as, as serious problems. Now, like everything in the U.S. government, not everything is 1,000% coordinated at all times, but I think there is this an, you know, overlapping uh, sense that we are facing a serious, almost existential problem uh, for, for democracy in the, around the world. And you know, I think the underlying key issue here is you know, it's easy to sort of talk about democracy and this and that, but the technologies of how information moves around um, you know, are essential to what a country is like. I, and we believe very strongly that the kind of technologies that countries end up installing or using and relying upon have some role in determining their future course. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, and that you could say that, you could have said that 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, whether it's the printing press, uh, whether it was the rise of, of, of broadcast radio and, and, and others. But you know, right now, it, it is the Internet, what the Internet looked like, that is uh, going to matter. And that's why we take this, uh, this issue so seriously. In so, other words, communication is destiny, put it that way. <laughs> so yeah. it's, I think it's really impactful that you said that. But many of the large technology companies that control so much of this infrastructure are built in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been somewhat reticent to regulate, or at least relative to the European Union's new uh, you know, set of interventions like the Digital Services Act, um, for instance, may be the most relevant to, to promoting um, the democratic interest of larger platforms. Um, would you or broadly the Biden administration welcome that type of push, a little more systemic regulation and uh, democratic influence on large technology platforms? And do you see that as related to this? I, I think um, everything here is interrelated. And let me just make a few uh, points on that. I think we've said repeatedly um, that, and, and you know, most of the regulation we've been speaking about here is privacy and, and, uh, yeah. and tech antitrust. And I, we have said repeatedly that uh, we have support and are, uh, uh, in fact, enthusiastic about the uh, progress of bipartisan bills in, in Congress on both the subject of, of tech antitrust and privacy. And um, that's something we've been watching, we've been supporting. So the Biden administration has been, uh, has been clear about that. Uh, at the same time, and I think this is um, something we need to recognize that's very important, and a fundamentally important part of a democracy is freedom of speech. So, um, you know, it won't do for us to set, you know, to, to support, um, uh, you know, a regulatory approach that does not respect the fundamental importance of freedom of speech in a democracy. You know, it's, it's possible to be wrong. So in everything uh, that we're, we're, we're doing, um, we are trying to support, um, you know, protection for citizens against uh, market power and, and, uh, uh, force, and, and uh, forces that might uh, damage democracy, while at the same time remaining and, and holding on to the utmost respect for the principles of free speech, which are important to this country. I would, I, you know, I think there's parts of uh, the DSA, and I, I won't push in this pretty specific part, but the independent researcher access, for instance, has gotten some renewed attention that would allow researchers to examine large platforms but not necessarily uh, influence directly the decisions, which is one of the, the EU proposals that I'm a little uh, partial to, to give away my, my bias here. <laughs> Um, so I want to move to a few audience questions. Um, the most common question I heard in, in advance, um, which I'll, I'll probably add a finer point to, was, was the Internet a mistake? Um, but I think <laughs> I'll uh, get a little more specific for you. Um, currently, the Internet is subsidized by ads. Does the future Internet need another funding source to create healthier democracies? This is to say, is the core ad tech model of the web part of the problem here? So... On the question of whether the internet uh, is a mistake, even though we, uh, uh, you know, occasionally decry what, what's happening on social media and so forth, you know, all technologies sort of go through their, through their ebbs and flows. And I think one of the genius of the American system 
is that we have this amazing ability to, to, to recover and, and re-understand uh, what it takes to make, uh, you know, to, to have a media really support uh, a democracy, the kind of society we want. I'm reminded uh, by the fact that by the late 1950s, everyone had declared that television had been a complete disaster. This was after the quiz show scandals where everyone said, you know, we just made this extraordinarily mistake, had this medium with so much potential, and we let it become uh, consumed, frankly, by, uh, by advertising. And one of the things that, uh, and, you know, right now we live in what I think many people would acknowledge be a golden age of, of television with so many choices and money spent on high-quality content. And one of the things I think is so great about this country is our capacity to learn uh, from our, our mistakes and um, rededicate ourselves to the original uh, founding, uh, the founding vision. So I think we live in an era where it's, you know, very obvious to a lot of people, and I think this is a strength, that there have been, um, you know, that the internet has uh, gone a distance away from what people hoped would be its sort of natural democracy uh, supporting and, and uh, healthy uh, tendencies for society. I think those of us who were active in the space in, in the 90s and the thousands just thought, you know, you turn the thing in, there was something magical about the TCP IP protocol that would bring out the best nature, the, you know, the good side of everybody um, and make them, you know, sort of live in, in harmony. Uh, that may have been a little too, uh, too uh, optimistic. Um, and we're obviously in, this, in, in, in a course correction. And I'm, uh, you know, in this sense, optimistic, which is to say there's a lot of people thinking very hard about whether there are ways we can rethink what the Internet is. I mean, the principle of connecting everyone is a very sound one. Um, but are there ways we can, uh, you know, as a society, work together to make it healthier, better? And that involves government. That involves major companies. That involves stakeholders, all of us, in trying to envision how the Internet uh, can be better and support the values we believe in. Um, more than a few people asked in what ways civil society activists, philanthropists, foundations can support. We've talked most of this time about nation states. What about everybody else? What are the efforts that you see that are particularly promising or the work that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, look, I think there are, uh, you know, as, as Tim said, um, we're not going to be able to carry any agenda forward on the Internet without the support uh, and the accountability uh, of um, civil society of the companies of the whole uh, group of stakeholders that are involved in the internet. Um, look, I think for civil society, the kind of research that civil society look, government is not going to be well positioned, for example, to do the kind of work on tracking is there a recession and freedom online that civil society can do. Right, there are just some things that you need the kind of independence of civil society organizations to do. I think that's true in the research front. I think that is true on holding governments to account to make sure that we have lived uh, up to our commitments. And of course, philanthropists, I think, can be very involved in funding some of those efforts and also helping connect people online. I mean, the other thing, part of our DFI, uh, you know, there are like 3 billion people who are still not online. So when we talk about connecting all of humanity, we're only at maybe, what, 60% uh, or so uh, of humanity is connected. I think that's another huge uh, area of work over the next some years. Um, obviously, Tim was talking about the work we're doing domestically on that. Most people are connected, but trying to get them at high speed. But, but internationally, I think there's so much work to be done on the connectivity front. So this is definitely something that we're going to need um, all of your uh, work uh, and support uh, to carry forward. You know, looking back in <coughs> history, just to add on that, <coughs> the Internet uh, itself, when it was the ARPANET um, back in the 70s when um, I was a young man, just kidding, then uh, the... Uh, Back in, in, its, uh, in its founding era, you know, it was a government-funded project, but it was um, uh, the, the principal researchers were, were in academia and in industry, and, um, uh, and, and it was, and, you know, their efforts to, to build the support by government is what made the, the United States the inventor of the Internet, but it then uh, had a significant uh, moments where it wouldn't have gone forward without, you know, civil society getting uh, involved in various ways, researchers, and then ultimately uh, industry when the internet finally became commercial in the 1990s, um, pioneering new interests. So there is, uh, in, in history, a successful model uh, for how almost every part of society uh, uh, can work together. And I guess the, what I'd say is we need to figure out what everyone uh, does best. You know what I mean? Um, there's certain things government does well and certain things government does not do well. Same with private industry. And same, frankly, with there's always been a significant public nonprofit side uh, to 
you know, the Internet's operations. To this day, some of the most important websites, the most traffic websites like Wikipedia, continue to be uh, nonprofits. Um, and when you think of other media like radio and television, you've had important nonprofit roles. And I think one question that we should move forward is whether that you know, nonprofit uh, side of the Internet is something that uh, uh, we need to, to make sure is always strong and vibrant the way it has been on other, on other media. Yeah, but more, we need it all, everything to be sort of in balance. More Wikipedias would yeah. be nice. We're really here to restore balance to the force. You know. <laughs> sure, a totally accessible goal. Um, I want to thank both of you. Any parting thoughts? We have just a minute before we switch over to our reaction panelists. Any uh, last thoughts? My feeling is we can do it. <laughs> I, I'm optimistic. I think there's a lot of goodwill. I think there's a real desire um, you know, for this thing that originally started here and has very good... You know, it's like a house with really good bones. It, the traditions of the Internet are strong. They're routed in, in an idea of, of free speech, of democracy, of, of trying to build a society that is uh, fundamentally uh, for, for the people. And it's always been a very decentralized medium. It was born to be that way. It was born to accept change. So some of what we uh, see and, you know, may be concerned about with the Internet right now, it's important to understand that that is not a fixed state. You, you know what I mean? That this was designed from the beginning to be a, 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 a network of networks, a flexible medium, something that can be the best of human aspirations. And we need to turn that corner and have the future that we want. OK, ending on a positive note, Tim Wu and Peter Harrell, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and I want to welcome our reaction panelists, which are uh, Ali Funk, Stephen Feldstein, and Jessica Brandt to come up, and I'll introduce them in just a second. Okay, so we're going to move on to the second part. We have a really excellent reaction panel um, to talk about what we just heard and the broader state of digital repression. Immediately to my left is um, a closest to me um, is uh, research director Ali Funk, who's research director at Freedom House. Um, she leads the Technology and Democracy Initiative there. Um, they produce the Freedom on the Net Index, which is one of these uh, global rankings that Tim just mentioned. And it is extraordinarily important. Um, they have an index with 70 countries on there and how they're doing in terms of digital freedom. They have an annual report, and they have 70 country-level reports that dive into the individual states of how these countries are doing with digital repression and democracy on the web. I could not endorse that work more. Ali, thank you so much for being here. Um, in the middle of this, of our group here, is Stephen Feldstein, who's senior uh, fellow um, for democracy, conflict, and governance at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, he wrote this absolutely excellent book my book so I can be super explicit pitching it to all of you. It's going to go right there. Uh, called The Rise of Digital Repression. I honestly think it is the uh, singularly excellent resource on this topic. And, and if you're going to just buy one thing to learn more about that, I would absolutely recommend it. Um, before his role at Carnegie, uh, Stephen was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and has worked on these issues for a long time. And then uh, furthest from me is Jessica Brandt, who's a policy director here at Brookings for our Artificial Intelligence and Emerging Technology Initiative. She's also a fellow in the Foreign Policy Program. Um, before Brookings, uh, Jessica was a co-author on a tremendously important uh, report with a somewhat innocuous name. It's called Linking Values and Strategy, which is like the most nothing of a name. It is about a comprehensive plan for the US and its democratic allies around the world to use non-military approaches to outcompete autocracies. It's extraordinarily important, and it was uh, developed with a, a lead of really great experts on this. Um, so maybe join me in welcoming them all real quick. If I can just get a round of applause. Thank you. Um, so Ali, I want to start with you. Um, can you elaborate some on the global context that we're seeing? Be welcome to expand on or challenge or add to the framing that Tim and I just gave just a few minutes ago. Yeah, happy to. Um, sorry. Thanks, that okay? Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here, for having me. Um, my name is Allie, like we said. Um, before I dive into some of the trends, I just want to say Freedom House, uh, we produce this Freedom on the Net report, but we work with a network of over 80 researchers around the world who do uh, that work on the ground, who are on the front lines of experiencing digital repression. Um, so I want to center them in our conversation today. 
Uh, we've attracted, we started Freedom on the Net in 2009, a very exciting time. We all thought internet was great, everything was going to be good. Boy, were we wrong. Um, so it's been 11 consecutive years of decline for internet freedom. I keep joking every year, maybe we'll have our first positive year. Uh, 2022, I don't think will be it. Um, <laughs> surprise. Uh, so there's a number of different trends we've we picked up through the years that I just wanted to, to highlight that have really driven this. I think first has to do with just a global assault on free expression. Um, so last year, in at least 56 countries, uh, we tracked somebody being arrested, prosecuted for their political, social, cultural speech online. And just to you know, get into that. In 56 places, people were arrested for just a Facebook post, talking about their religious expression, talking about what, who they want to vote for. I mean, that's a wild number, um, especially as somebody who lives in the U.S. with very strong First Amendment protections. Um, more governments are also just shutting off the Internet altogether, particularly around protests, elections, just you know, halting communication. Um, and if you imagine if you're in a time of crisis and you can no longer uh, text your mom, that's terrifying, especially if your mother is as engaged uh, with your life as me. So, um, and then, you know, another trend that I wanted to, to mention today has to do with abusive surveillance. Um, surveillance has just proliferated around the world, um, you know, undermining not just people's privacy rights, but due process, under other fundamental freedoms. I think, you know, zooming in there, spyware is a big trend that we've been tracking He's been tracking. I know a lot of other organizations like Citizen Lab has been doing a lot of great work on there. Um, so another data point to throw out because that's what Freedom House does. Authorities in at least 45 countries are using tools like NSO Group, uh, you know, Cellbrite, uh, other extraction technology. Um, and then the final one I want to mention is just the rise of cyber sovereignty. And that's a little wonky term, but what I mean by that is this idea that governments want to build their own rules and create a border over the internet. So undermining the idea that regardless of where you're based, you can access the same tools, the same platforms, the same information. And then the last thing before I pass it back uh, that I want to note, um, and I was really excited to hear Tim's comments about uh, reform domestically in the US as well, is we talk a lot about how you know, authoritarian countries like Egypt, Russia, Iran, China are driving the decline of internet freedom. But I don't think we can forget the role that democracies are playing in this. Um, it's not just you know, these, these spaces. The US has had four consecutive years of decline in internet freedom. We've seen rising surveillance. Uh, you know, just the way disinformation online has led to offline harms, thinking of the January 6th attack. Um, so I think any sort of conversation about what to do has to do with how democracies are playing a role and how we can hold each other accountable. Sure. Thanks. I, you know, all of these indices also mirror this point that the U.S. is not immune to this and isn't, as I'm sure many of you know by following the news here, is part of this democratic decline. Um, Stephen, I want to ask you to frame the decision-making of autocracies and ask a little bit more about why they use digital repression. You have a great concept in your book called The Dictator's Digital Dilemma. I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about your experience and why individual autocracies choose to do this and what they're thinking about when they do. Sure. Uh, and again, I want to thank you for having me on. This is a real pleasure to actually see you all in person as opposed to sort of through a little, little block uh, <laughs> online. Uh, so, you know, first of all, I, I also think that, you know, I want to build off of what Ali said, which is that so much of what we're looking at is interrelated in the sense that digital repression is really linked to this democratic recession that you talked about. Uh, and that's really hard, I think, to separate out the two. And when I approached looking, you know, working on my book, I think one of the primary questions I initially was interested in was, to what extent does political regime type actually affect the use of these tools uh, for repressive or authoritarian purposes? And what I found was that after breaking down the data, looking around the world, was that there's a very strong relationship between the two, which, is on, which shouldn't come as a huge surprise, but actually seeing that encapsulated uh, in evidence and numbers I thought was really important. So then from that point, one of the, the aspects I really wanted to hone in on was what is behind authoritarian strategies. And so if you, if you take it that uh, one of the big vulnerabilities uh, behind an authoritarian regime is the fact that they don't have the consent of the governed and they have to re uh, rely on sort of 
a few different ways in which to ensure their power, a mixture of coercion, so using force, a mixture of co-optation, so essentially bribery or providing inducements, uh, and then you know, trying to find other ways through you know, uh, peer effect and so forth uh, to get people to follow them. Uh, it's, a shaky, it's a shaky foundation. Uh, and what's even shakier uh, is the fact that when it comes to something like the, digital, uh, the dictator's digital dilemma, uh, is that there's a bit of a balance that regimes have to strike. So on the one hand, there's a need for control, right? There's a need to ensure that the information that flows within a society is one that they can regulate. And so that's, be, that's what you see when you look at the Great Firewall. That's when you see, when you see mass surveillance techniques in China, in Iran, in uh, Russia, and so forth. But some countries, uh, particularly those that have a degree of openness, also have uh, a trade-off when it comes to preserving an open society enough that they can actually integrate uh, and take advantage of economic benefits that result from being connected to the world. And so, you know, you see countries and leaders constantly making a calculus when it comes to saying, to what degree can we balance one with the other? Certain countries have decided control is the most paramount thing that's, that's necessary. So in Iran, for example, uh, there is a willingness to forego the benefits, the economic benefits of uh, global integration uh, because maintaining that control is so important. Uh, in Russia, you also see a movement towards that control imperative. But what's interesting is that there are still some platforms like YouTube and Telegram that remain open, and that's part of this kind of counter, counterbalancing effect. Uh, and then other places like India, you see a real struggle where, uh, on the one hand, there is a desire and a push to constrain and limit information. But on the other hand, so much of the dynamism behind the society uh, and the economy in India is built upon uh, this linkage uh, to, the, to the global, to the outside world. And so uh, there is sort of a built-in constraint in terms of how much Modi or others are willing to push uh, this. And so that's where the dilemma comes in. Uh, countries face a bit of a decision when it comes to balancing control uh, with the economic benefits uh, and social benefits of, of openness. Mm. Um, Jessica, so I want to bring you in. Thanks for being the third and sure. panelist who has to wait a little bit. <laughs> um, so your team recently, and you're welcome to respond to either of those two points, but your team also recently published a new report on the increasing sophistication of Chinese manipulation of uh, online platforms, especially search results, which is maybe a little under-discussed, um, on topics like human rights abuses in Xinjiang, on COVID, on Russian aggression in Ukraine, the Russian war in Ukraine. Um, I'm asking, are Thorntians getting better at this, too? Are they, are they improving in their capacity to drive their narratives and win digital uh, battles for yeah. knowledge and control? Yeah, I think they are. Um, I, I guess what I'd say, you know, builds on what Stephen has just shared, which is, you know, I think she, like Putin, views information as a threat. It is a weapon to be wielded abroad, and it is something to be tightly controlled at home. Um, and I think that is what is driving an increasingly forward-leaning, you know, and I think cross-platform effort um, to conduct information manipulation campaigns around topics that are of geopolitical salience to Beijing. And these are particularly topics that, you know, help to sort of position China as a responsible global player and to push back on criticisms of its rights record, of its early mishandling of the pandemic, for example, um, criticisms that would suggest otherwise. Um, so this recent work, um, you know, looks at how China has exploited search engine results. Um, I think that's a really underexplored vector of information manipulation. We know from previous research that this is something that you know, Russia has had some success at doing, and it looks like China's building on that model. Now, you know, we tracked uh, you know, that phenomenon related to COVID and to Xinjiang because we know that those are two spaces where you know, Beijing really has an interest um, in deflecting blame um, you know, for for some of its uh, for some of its misdeeds, um, and I guess you know what I would say is that this is. Um you know, one of many tools that the, I, I guess I would say one thing, which is we don't know whether what we're picking up is like an intentional, you know, sort of Chinese strategy or is it a byproduct of the fact that, you know, open media, um, you know, was able to, you know, the New York Times wrote one piece debunking the Fort teacher conspiracy theory. Uh, they wrote that piece a year ago and they moved on to cover other newsworthy topics, whereas, you know, Beijing sort of sits atop a, a propaganda apparatus that churns out content every single day. Um, it's not really beholden to budgets. It's not really beholden to audience desires. And so um, I think a challenge we face is that this particular dynamic isn't necessarily search engines failing. They're prioritizing uh, and serving up fresh, relevant content for the query that users are delivering. Um, 
you know, but nevertheless, what we found is that just for searches of the neutral term Xinjiang, the name of the place, um, for every single day of our search, you know, Chinese state media was appearing in the top 10, which means that users who are sort of, you know, coming to this um, with an open mind might stumble into, um, you know, propaganda without sort of the context for what they're looking at. And I would say the same dynamic is driving, um, you know, a more assertive, uh, expansive, and elaborate surveillance system within China, um, which I think many of you have probably seen the New York Times, you know, recent reporting. But we're not just talking about facial recognition. We're talking about, you know, voice prints and DNA collection and iris scans and other forms of data um, that are married up, um, you know, to, to exact this form of repression at home. And I think the fear is that, you know, that this repression is widening and that it's not going to stay in China. So just a quick follow-up to that. Sometimes this battle for the Internet is, is called sort of um, asymmetric. Is this an example of that, where authoritarian countries are willing to do things that democratic countries really aren't? Yeah, I think this is a key asymmetry. I mean, I think authoritarian regimes recognize that open information environments, I think while they confer tremendous strengths on democratic societies over the long run, um, in the near term, there are you know, certain vulnerabilities, right? I mean, democracies depend on the idea that the truth is knowable and that citizens can discern it and use it to make decisions for self-governance. And autocrats have no such need for a healthy information space to thrive. So I think what this means is that you know, democracies are somewhat constrained by norms and also, I think, uh, uh, an appropriate desire to protect their own information environments that make it much harder um, for them to carry out the kinds of activities that you know, uh, authoritarian regimes are quite capable on in the short term. Right? There's virtually no normative constraints online. The platforms don't, you know, they're American companies, they're not Chinese companies. Um, so I, I, you know, we can talk about it in, in the open discussion. I think there's lots of things that we can do to, to you know, succeed in an information competition in ways that are you know, concordant with our values. I would say the administration's, I think, very novel and effective approach at declassifying, downgrading intelligence, and sharing it with the world ahead of and after um, you know, the invasion of Ukraine um, on February 24th is a great example of using truthful information to go out and contest the information space. I think it made it harder for fence sitters to fence it. I think it really bound allies together. It built support support for a tougher response. Those are the kinds of sort of tools that I think are available to democracies. So it doesn't mean we have to cede the space, but we have to do it in ways that are sort of reflective of our values and the asymmetric advantages that we have, which is our intelligence capabilities, our partners, et cetera. That's a really good example. So I want to come from this general context back to the declaration. Um, Stephen, I'm going to lead off with you. You've written a lot about the choices, about why states use digital oppression under what circumstances. Does this declaration, do you think it's going to be effective in changing state behavior? And I'm sort of especially curious about states that may have had a past with some or dabbling with digital repression or that are wavering or weak democracies. Yeah. No, good question. Um, look, I, I think it's a really important first start. Uh, I do. And, and you know, I, one of the things I mention a lot in my writing and book uh, is the idea that you have to establish norms. And I think this is an area where we've let those dissipate. We've let those break down. And I think part of the problem is the fact that within democracies themselves, you see a real qu- uh, erosion in the quality of governance, uh, and particularly in liberal democracies, right? So whether it's the United States and on a host of, of different issues or weaker democracies where we've seen pretty troubling, um, you know, uh, diminishments of free speech uh, and so forth, we have allowed that, that, that to sort of, that trend to kind of to, to occur. Uh, in the meantime, we haven't put up a vision uh, of what, what does, do we actually stand for. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, when I say this is, this is a first start in the sense that, you know, good, we've been able to rally, you know, core liberal democracies, largely in Europe, uh, other sort of like-minded democracies in other regions, and I think that's a really important thing. Uh, I think the next challenge is how do you expand that out further? Uh, you know, what about India, Brazil, Nigeria, South Africa, and so forth? Uh, you know, is there a way to bring them in to uh, subscribe to these principles while ensuring that they, they, they don't actually dilute them? And with India uh, and with prior G7 statements on Internet shutdowns, for example, we've seen, at least in the back room, where there is a willingness uh, uh, on their part, whether it's India or other weaker democracies, to, to tamp down standards that I think are important. So that will be a challenge. Mm-hmm. I, I think the other uh, aspect to this that, that's also uh, important uh, is, is sort of saying, okay, look, we have, you know, what do we, what do, we do next to operationalize it, to make it real, right? We have, you know, high concept standards that are important that people subscribe to. Well, what does it mean in terms of those that uh, flout them willingly? 
Uh, what does it mean when it comes to fence-sitting countries that uh, are sort of, well, maybe we're interested, but you know, we see things a different way. There's a whole kind of sovereignty push these days when it comes to the country saying, look, universalism is one thing, but we really have a way that we handle these issues. So how does this normative framework push back against that? To me, that's where the real test will be in the coming months. I want to extend the same question to you. Anything to add to what Stephen just said? I thought it was quite great. Um, and I totally agree. I think that I have my own list of all the different things that the U.S. government's doing, so maybe we could all share lists <laughs> and see if we missed anything. Um, and I view each of these as a step in the right direction. Individually, I don't think any of them are going to get us where we need to go. But together, they're pushing that needle. And I think this is where as wearing my civil society hat, is what is our role then to, to hold signatories to account? Um, I'm talking civil society broadly here, global civil society. How can we play a role in holding signatories to account? Uh, how can we then work with other multi-stakeholder networks like the Global Network Initiative and in which companies, tech companies are part of that in thinking about how to protect free expression and privacy? Um, so taking that multi-stakeholderism and putting it into action. Sure. So, and we've did this a few times. So maybe I maybe I should just say it. There is sort of a broader scope of initiatives and coming from the Biden administration that you might think are, are related. And I want to uh, to talk to you guys more about those. I see things like supporting privacy enhancing technologies, for which there's a U.S. EU and U.S. U.K. Uh, agreement to do, um, the EU-US one being through the Trade and Technology Council. Um, I mentioned the Open Tech Fund, which is supporting VPNs and peer-to-peer -peer internet that are exploding in use right now in Russia. Um, export controls and surveillance uh, companies, especially um, the NSO Group and Pegasus, but I don't expect that to be the only one. Um, and other efforts like supporting open source uh, infrastructure like the open radio access network um, and uh, broader open infrastructure that's not necessarily as tied to individual uh, countries and companies. Does this to you all, is that comprehensive? I'm missing huge things. I'm sure I am. Um, is there a systemic effort here and is that collection of efforts enough or do, would you like to see a more systemic comprehensive uh, uh, document or effort put forward? I mean, I'd say one of the most important things the administration has done, I think, is situated this within the context of a, of a broad asymmetric competition with authoritarian challengers that is taking place in the information space and in the technology domain, and that requires a strategy to put, push back. And I think having said that at the highest levels, what that enables is sort of some policy entrepreneurship across the administration and across, um, I would say, also like, you know, civil society entities and, and you know, think tanks and other partners um, to think about how they can do their part in advancing that goal. So I think all of the things that you've, you know, have been mentioned are, are related. Um, you know, I think, um, importantly, this is happening at the sort of at the normative level, right? The State Department, the, you know, building out the TTC and working closely with, um, you know, partners and allies um, through the Quad, for example, and that's happening at the practical level. So actually sort of providing uh, sort of privacy preserving tech, um, you know, to, to NGO activists and journalists who are operating, you know, in increasingly repressive environments. So I think that balance of activities is useful, um, and so I, I'm glad to see it. Stephen, anything to add? Yeah, look, I mean, I think these are all really positive things. I, I don't have anything negative to say about in these individual actions in of themselves. What I would say is that, I mean, it sort of depends on what the problem is that you're trying to solve. If you're trying to solve individual aspects of digital authoritarianism, then each one of these can do some good in terms of moving the ball forward. If you're looking kind of globally at, you know, Freedom House's 16 straight years of de democratic decline, and you think about all the different trends that are undermining democracies around the world when it comes to authoritarian consolidation, when it comes to weak democracies asserting sovereignty uh, and breaking down uh, norms, uh, when it comes to individual members of the liberal alliance, including 20% of the EU that are autocratizing at the moment, this won't really solve the issue. But the issue is brought in the tech. Tech is a part of it, but it's not, it's not the full picture. And so I guess the question you have to ask yourself is what are the ways that we can push uh, most beneficially on these issues that will uh, somehow lead to greater impact around the world when it comes to the global democracy struggle, which frankly we're losing. Uh, and to that, I don't think there are any good grand answers. I think it happens on a case-by-case, country-by-country uh, basis. Uh, I think certainly we should be very careful about the partners that the USG chooses when it, when it comes to what kind of leaders we meet with uh, and who we have bilateral relations with. I mean, that's a separate issue. But, um, you know, I think, so I think in the big picture, these will help, but they're not going to be transformational in terms of the global democratic, um, you know, struggles that we're, that we're grappling with. 
Ellie, I want to also ask you to weigh in, and specifically Freedom House has uh, called for a new cyber secure, cyberspace uh, office at the State Department, which we did just see the Biden administration create, I think, Cyberspace and Digital Bureau. Um, is that another step in the right direction? Are you happy to see that and other ways, broader efforts? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to see it. Um, I think, I was trying to think through, like, what, what, do, what do we want to see out of this, this new bureau or department? Um, I mean, the first thing is I want to see a human rights-centric approach, and this is something that I thought the Declaration did well on as they centered human rights in the conversation, um, talking about what is the national security implications, what are the business uh, implications, financial, of digital technology, I think is part of the puzzle, but really centering those human rights concerns, I think, is really key. So I'd like to see the Bureau do that. Um, the other, you know, I think it's been hard from a civil society perspective to figure out how do all these different initiatives connect to each other? Do they connect? Um, what's the overarching goal? Is there one? I mean, another one we haven't mentioned is the AI Bill of Rights. Um, that's sort of tangential to a lot of the, the topics that we're talking about here. Uh, administrative power at, at USAID is, is uh, you know, digital authoritarianism being a priority there. So how do those all connect? Um, because I think... If, if they're not, I assume folks are, folks are engaging, but um, making sure like they're all working together, I think is really important. And then the last thing, you know, I think that's really key, and I've mentioned in a previous answer, and I will continue to, to bring up, is meaningful multi-stakeholderism. So actually building formalized processes in which global civil society, particularly those in the global south, can engage with the center um, and give feedback on the things that they're doing. And then making sure that that feedback, they're actually working on it and responding to it. Because I'm not, as you know, I'm based in New York, I'm not going to be able to advise as well um, as a civil society group who is in India on the front lines of experience what an internet shutdown is like and might understand what are those levers of change that I can make in the Indian context um, to maybe change their own behavior. I, I don't have that expertise, but what I can do is try to help build those connections uh, and then make sure that the office or the, the new center is, is strengthening those. And then the last one I'll, I'll touch on, too, has to do with funding and making sure that those groups, uh, also academia, uh, those sectors are receiving uh, robust funding to do this work over time. Um, you know, there's the anti-censorship, the anti-surveillance tools that, you know, folks right now in Russia are really relying on. Um, but also things of like strategic litigation. That's been a really effective tool of pushing back against some problematic censorship and surveillance laws. Um, Indonesia is an example of where that's worked. So funding for these things that we know work, uh, we just need to get the resources to the people who need them. Yeah, that's a great point. There's There's been a lot of discussion around funding of anti-surveillance and anti-authoritarian tools, right, which is a line of research that is not as well funded as pro-authoritarian tools, especially because surveillance and ad money go hand in hand. Uh, and so it's nice to hear not only about the technology, but also about the, the civil society uh, funding as well. Um, I want to go towards the corporate side of this. And Jessica, maybe I'll start with you. Um, you've been looking into research uh, on autocracies and how they manipulate online platforms, largely or significantly held by um, countries in the West, though, though not always. Are they doing enough internally to combat um, authoritarian use? Do you think we need them to take a step up? Do you think there are legal or regulatory developments necessary to uh, ask them or require them to do more? Yeah, great question. I think I'd sort of bucket out the private sector and talk and think about sort of platforms as one bucket and, and other sort of U.S. technology firms uh, in another category. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think the most important thing we need from technology, from pl- uh, platform companies is to make transparency the norm. Um, and that means, you know, with trusted researchers, um, I think there's, um, you know, some promising efforts underway to try to think through how we can square the circle and accommodate privacy concerns um, with getting researchers the information they need to answer some really, you know, sort of foundational questions about how social media platforms are shaping our information environment. And then also transparency with users. So when it comes to, you know, sort of um, dealing with state-backed propaganda, uh, I think labeling and you know, sort of providing context is, is one of the most important measures. I'm actually really not in favor of the outright banning of state media, even Russian state media, and even at the request of European governments. I think um, outright bans on certain forms of content at the request of governments is a very slippery slope, and it's not necessary when there are other tools like deamplifying, demonetizing, and labeling. Um, on the sort of 
in the other bucket, I would say, you know, I just would like to see U.S. technology firms, and I would say actually also like research institutions, being thoughtful and doing their due diligence to make sure, um, you know, that they're not unwillingly participating um, in China's Orwellian surveillance state. I mean, it was not that long ago that MIT was, you know, revealed to have partnerships with, uh, I think it was SenseTime and uh, iFly Tech. I mean, these are sort of Chinese companies that are, you know, um, have uh, played a role in um, in the, you know, I think oppression of Uyghur minorities um, in China in a way that I think, you know, we would all find out right now. I think those partnerships have been, uh, you know, unwound, but I think it just speaks to the importance of really uh, upping due diligence. Stephen, uh, same-ish question to you on the role of companies. Do they have a role here, especially in changing the uh, pattern of thinking around this digital uh, dictator's digital dilemma? Can they raise the cost of digital repression from the corporate side of this? Yeah, actually, you know, let me just tell you a few things that worry me on the private sector side. Mm. Uh, so one thing that worries me uh, is the lack of transparency from uh, platforms like Telegram, TikTok, and to some extent YouTube when it comes to their uh, how, how widely they operate and how little they actually are accountable uh, when it comes to the type of information that is circulated. I would particularly say uh, with TikTok, uh, that's that's an area, and it, it's it's a platform that you know is fairly recent in terms of its uptake uh, when it comes to the Ukrainian war in particular, and the fact that it does remain operative in Russia, but it censors on any material linked to the Ukrainian war. Uh, I think we see a, a lot of this sort of. Um, we, we see them dodging around issues that other platforms are forced to uh, to be accountable for. So that's one thing. I think the second thing is that we've seen improved behavior from platforms when it comes to a range of digital authoritarianism, political issues worldwide. One of the things that we continue to see problems with is elections, uh, particularly in elections that are viewed as lower priority uh, for these companies. Uh, so you know, look at Kenya uh, uh, upcoming. Uh, look at uh, the Philippines, which just occurred, uh, you know, other countries like that. What we know is that uh, Facebook and other platforms have a certain amount of resources they're willing to dedicate to these issues. They're willing to throw a lot of resources and a lot of political capital uh, towards elections that really affect uh, a user base uh, in the global north. But when it comes to other countries, uh, they will sort of do haphazard measures, but they really won't push forward on that. To me, that's a big gap. That's a big problem as well. Also, countries, they're more afraid of passing regulatory uh, laws. Sure, right. And yeah. then I think that's a, that leads to a third issue, which is that there ought to be a way to sync up a better uh, balance uh, so that when uh, platforms are faced with making hard decisions, uh, if, you know, to the extent that they have or know that they have the backing of the USG, I think that can help. Uh, and so, you know, Russia, they were ultimately forced into a series of decisions because of political events. There are many other places, like let's say Vietnam, where maybe there's a way for a greater amount of conversation to occur uh, quietly between platforms and USG in terms of what's a coordinated policy when it comes to these freedom of expression issues that matters and makes sense, and, and what's a steer that we could give these companies in terms of how they balance uh, you know, massive takedown requests from the, you know, the Communist Party in Vietnam uh, you know, with balancing the fact that they do want to remain in country, and that does matter. Ellen, any quick thoughts? Then we're going to jump to <coughs> audience questions. Quick Thank thought, you. I think, is... Um, underlying both the comments we just heard is there's really no one size fits all. All the, Different platforms have different risks. You know, if the platform is owned by a Chinese company, then that platform or that company is going to be held to really onerous data localization policies in China, really onerous surveillance, uh, censorship requirements. If it's own VK, a Russian social media platform owned by a Putin ally, may then be more likely to censor content about the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, so I think understanding that we shouldn't treat every tech company the same is really, really important. Um, and then designing regulation around those different nuances is key. And then also the context. The way we might want to advocate for Twitter or a Facebook to respond to a request in one country might actually be different than to another country based on the needs of folks uh, on the ground or who live there. Um, and this is something we hear from our partners all the time of like, you really need to think about the context. Um, so I just thought I would underscore that. Sure. Um, so audience question, I'm gonna direct it to Jessica first, and but you're welcome to uh, either uh, Stephen or Ali jump in. Um, 
Studies earlier in the decade, in the 2010s, on Chinese internet censorship used to find some degree of freedom of expression, and this was key to the CCP's authoritarian resilience. <laughs> Has this changed? Has it become more repressive in the last decade? Yeah. It's a great question. I think this is called diffusion pr proofing, right? It's sort of, there's a lot of evidence that authoritarian regimes are becoming more resilient in part because they're adopting some of the sort of, at least the patina of democratic, um, sort of, of democratic infrastructure, right? So creating some managed or controlled space. Um, you know, for expression, and that this has sort of contributed to the rising um, durability and longevity of personalist regimes. Um, so I think you know, you're, I think you're picking up on a phenomenon that's absolutely correct. I do have a sense that the repression is increasing, um, and I think the. Um, vast amount of evidence that the, you know, the sort of repressive, the instruments of power that would enable the state to go farther in its repression, um, the, the state is building those tools um, and is, you know, des and desires to go further. So my, my worry is about, you know, I think, I think we've moved in the wrong direction and I fear that what we're watching is the state preparing itself to go even farther. Stephen Early, any thoughts on that? I'll just add one point, which is that, you know, we've been uh, speculating for a while what would happen when it, when it came to the COVID pandemic and some of the different QR codes and so forth that would be used and whether those would be exploited. And we haven't seen as much evidence as that as we feared. But in China now, we're actually starting to see that uh, take place. And I think most recently, uh, uh, you know, where there were planned protests, they used QR codes to suddenly turn people's phones from green to red uh, in terms of basically saying, because you now have COVID or you're infected, you, you can't go attend this protest. And so... That's anecdotal. That's one. I don't know if this is going to become, uh, you know, something that happens on a mass scale. Uh, but I also don't know of all the different other times something like this is already occurring in which we have no information. And so, you know, a lot of this stuff tends to me seems a bit cumulative. You know, you start with laying a foundation of repression. You begin by kind of uh, employing different types of uh, algorithms, mass surveillance, and so forth. You uh, deploy QR codes as part of your lockdown procedures. You start exploring those QR codes, and it goes on and on and on. And, and it doesn't reverse. It doesn't get better, at least not the trajectory that we've seen uh, uh, in China. Okay. Well, I think that actually may be our last question. Um, I want to uh, ask you all to join me in thanking our esteemed panelists yeah. for joining us today. Ali Fong, Stephen Teldstein, and Jessica Brandt. Um, I really meant every word about their content that they've been producing on these topics. My absolute first recommendation for you to go check out if you want to learn more. Um, otherwise, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you uh, enjoyed the event. Thank you.